Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new episode of Stories from Space Podcast, where your host, Matthew Williams, examines the history of human spaceflight, the breakthroughs that revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in it, and the brave individuals who work tirelessly to advance the frontiers of our understanding. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. The authors acknowledge that this podcast was recorded on the traditional unceded lands of the Lekwungen peoples. Welcome back to Stories from Space. I'm your host, Matt Williams, and joining me today is a very special guest, the Israeli-American theoretical physicist, astrophysicist, and cosmologist, Professor Abraham Loeb. Professor Loeb, welcome aboard. Thanks for having me. You can call me Avi. Okay, (laughs) will do. So to give the listeners a brief rundown of your credentials, and I've, I've had to write these out several times when writing articles and pieces that feature your work, and I found that it, it is hard to keep up with all the, the titles and <laughs> abbreviations, but I, I think I've got a shortest version here possible. So Professor Loeb is the Frank B. Baird Jr., Professor of Science at Harvard University, He is the longest serving chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative, the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and a leading authority on hypervelocity stars, black holes, interstellar objects, astral biology, and anything else? Thank you, Matt. Actually, you know, um, in the recent expedition, uh, I boarded a private jet that took uh, took us to the ship that we used, and um, uh, the the pilot welcomed me as I uh, entered the jet. He said, "Welcome aboard, Professor Loeb." And I told him, "No titles are needed. You can just call me Avi because I'm a fundamentally I'm a curious farm boy." So we could have saved you some time if you described just <laughs> me by just these three words. Okay, well, people, uh, I feel, yeah, they'll they'll figure it out. Um, in addition, you are also the science theory director of Breakthrough Initiatives, and we've chatted several times about Breakthrough Starshot and your work there. And as I understand it, in June 2020, you were also sworn in as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Yeah, this is uh, true. Um, I served on that uh, board um, advising uh, on on science matters, uh, the White House. But uh, overall, you know, uh, fundamentally, I'm just curious about the cosmic neighborhood we inhabit and in particular, whether we have any neighbors. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and this, this has been the subject of your work for quite some time now. I, I remember when I first came across your work, it was uh, one of the first articles I'd written. You had written an article on how hypervelocity stars escape our galaxy all the time and how they could actually bring their planets along for the ride and how this would have drastic implications for panspermia and how life gets distributed throughout the universe. Yeah, in fact, um, there are very fast stars uh, originating from the vicinity of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, but other um, uh, galaxies uh, eject stars close to the speed of light uh, when they have mergers of two supermassive black holes that act as a slingshot that could kick stars up to the speed of light. So, in fact, uh, throughout the intergalactic space, uh, the cosmic space, Uh, There are stars moving at a fraction of the speed of light and being on a planet around them must be thrilling because then you traverse space close to the highest speed possible. Uh, Also, you live longer relative to other uh, uh, cosmic uh, civilizations because of the time dilation if you're really moving close to the speed of light. So um, there must be some uh, beneficiary of these cosmic events uh, where Two black holes are at uh, relatively uh, close proximity to each other. They move around and they uh, slingshot stars into intergalactic space at close to the speed of light. Uh, unfortunately, we are in a relatively 
uh, we are stuck, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. on the Earth around this uh, typical star, the Sun, and uh, not much, uh, I mean, the speed of the Sun relative to the uh, center of the Milky Way galaxy is, is merely uh, just a tenth of a percent of the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So we're not likely to go intergalactic anytime soon, <laughs> is what I'm No. Yeah, well, no. yeah, listeners, I, as they take this down, though, stars transporting entire solar systems, they could be, they could be how an intergalactic travel actually happens. Who knows? We may get visited yeah. someday, and that would really be interesting. I mean, the, the only thrilling experience in our near future is uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the sister galaxy of the Milky Way. Uh, it's on its path towards... Uh, merger with the Milky Way galaxy and it will come to our neighborhood within a few billion years and at that point it's possible that it will uh, kick the sun a little bit outwards from the center of the merger product but that will not be such a dramatic change I mean it yeah, we will we could potentially see the Milky Way from a distance so to speak uh, as uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy comes by and perhaps grabs the sun and then eventually merges with it. Uh, altogether, it will become one giant elliptical galaxy after the merger takes place. And, um, you know, we, uh, the rest of the universe, aside from this merger product, will recede away from us at an ever increasing speed. We will be left surrounded by darkness in the distant future. And so we better take a look right now about what the universe has because. Tens of billions of years from now, we won't have any clue as to what happens to those distant galaxies that will exit from our event horizon. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do like your optimism and thinking that <laughs> humanity or its its progeny will be around, and I, I certainly hope you're right. Because <laughs> yes, and that yeah, yeah that, that is something else I recall um, writing about was what's it going to be like in the year one trillion or so. For yeah. life forms living in a universe where even the nearest galaxy is beyond you know, their their event horizon, they can't see. Well, the, the first step uh, for survival would be to move away from the sun, uh, because within a billion years the sun will boil off all the oceans on Earth. So we just have twenty percent or fifth, a fifth of our of the age of the Earth left for us to uh, still be here. Uh, and I actually moved towards a star that is much longer lived than the than the sun. And actually, the nearest star to us right now um, is uh, Proxima Centauri. And it will um, live uh, hundreds of times longer than the sun. So we might move there or to any dwarf star that weighs, uh, that has a mass that is a tenth of the mass of the sun. And those stars live for uh, potentially trillions of years. So uh, uh, we could survive that long if we were to go to a, a furnace, a, a nuclear reactor that burns the fuel much more slowly. But of course, uh, such a furnace uh, is uh, fainter than the sun. So we will, I mean, the habitable region around it is closer in. Um, and actually, there is a habitable planet in principle near Proxima Centauri. It's called Proxima B. There is a, another one that, uh, was detected that may also be habitable. The only problem is that when you get close to the furnace, these these small stars are uh, have a, a large flares, and especially in the ultraviolet, and it's not at all clear whether these flares allow life as we know it, because they may sterilize the planet. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you've you've written quite a few papers on on the possible habitability of Proxima B based on what we know, right? And uh, right. around Red Wars. And I, I remember, I remember a paper you wrote that said that, uh, given the long timelines of of red dwarf stars and how they're the most common in the universe, that this could have a Fermi paradox implication. And right. uh, yeah, I, I even listed it as a, one of the possible resolutions to the Fermi paradox. Well, th there is this fundamental question: Why are we next to a star which is not the most abundant in the Milky Way galaxy? The dwarf stars are ten times more abundant, and uh, the answer may be that the life as we know it is not possible near those much more abundant stars. And of course, it will take us a while to figure it out and uh, why exactly that's the case. It's possible that they cannot maintain their 
uh, atmospheres because of the flares on the host star, because of the excess ultraviolet emission. We know these are features of dwarf stars. Uh, and so a star like the sun is perhaps a better furnace uh, for life that mm-hmm. develops on time scales of billions of years. But um, in principle, we don't even need a star. That's the old fashioned way of keeping us warm. If we are an advanced technological civilization, we could build our own habitat and, for example, have our own nuclear reactors. We don't need to use gravity for uh, nuclear fusion. We can uh, just do it uh, ourselves. And uh, in principle, you can imagine a future where humanity will live on a space station. And um, in fact, uh, you can live next to a star like the sun even as it evo- evolves, because if you adjust your distance from the furnace so that you are still comfortable, uh, then you can always maintain uh, habitability. It's much better to do that than to sit on a rock that happened to be at some distance and therefore is habitable for a fixed amount of time. So uh, I, I, th- I see our future perhaps on a moving platform that can adjust its distance from stars and potentially also become independent uh, because it produces its own energy supply. Um, Mm -hmm. You can also think about other civilizations, you know, around other stars. And if they were not sophisticated enough to build such a platform and they were left on the rock that they were born on, uh, then uh, they probably cried for help when the star became much more bright. I mean, most stars formed billions of years before the sun. So it's possible that their cries for help uh, came uh, billions of years ago, and we we were not around to listen. Um, obviously, these cries for help are the best sources for radio signals. If we are ever hoping to detect someone, it would be when they cry for help. Uh, and if nobody listens, these cries would end up, in, you know, this would be the most uh, important news item uh, in their <laughs> news reports in the media. It's not global warming as a result of the technologies. It's because of the star because, and you can't really control the star. And, and so they must have tried to do mass exodus on spaceships and who knows whether they survived or not. It's quite likely that a lot of civilizations came and went uh, and are by now gone, you know, and therefore when we try to uh, address the Fermi paradox, we ask, oh, what what is the chance that we would get a radio signal? Well, that depends on the lifespan of a technological civilization that enters the Drake equation. But um, the point is, if those technological civilizations sent um, uh, equipment to space in the form of Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, or New Horizons that we sent to interstellar space, um, and they will exit the solar system in 10,000 years. Uh, They would leave the Oort cloud. Um, You know, they will become space trash. And it's possible that the interstellar space is littered with such trash, space trash from civilizations that are gone by now. The senders are not alive anymore. And of course, we can learn about those past civilizations by finding this trash. Their trash is our gold because we can learn about their history from this trash. It's just like archaeology. We can also figure out how we can survive longer, what is the best approach for us to go become an interstellar species. So there are lots of things that we could learn as long as we are open-minded enough to look around and check our backyard, meaning the Ooh. solar system for any interstellar objects. And, ju- you know, just an anecdote, the, the first interstellar objects were detected only over the past decade. We just Ooh. didn't have the facilities to detect them before. And the first was um, actually a meteor uh, detected by U.S. government uh, sensors, mostly satellites, back in 2014. And I went after its relics, actually, just a few weeks ago. And the second was uh, Oumuamua. So, you know, um, there were. Uh, this was a relatively recent uh, t- uh, event. Uh, these were just detected over the past decade, and we have a lot to learn about what our cosmic neighborhood uh, might uh, have sent us. Uh, you know, we can learn about our neighbors just by looking at our backyard. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, I mean, that brings us to the real piece de resistance here um and (laughs) yeah and and what is i i would say arguably this has been your 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 focus it's been what a lot of your activities have been about these past few years uh for so amuamua was the first interstellar object that we detected as it was passing by earth 
Um, but yes, it, it, later later um, review of uh, of archival data revealed that that wasn't the first. That in fact it was the 2014 one. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Oumuamua was the size of a football field, uh, about mm -hmm. 100 meters, and um, it was the it was discovered by Panstars as a near Earth object. Panstars was a telescope that. Uh, was constructed to find near-Earth objects, so it flagged this one as well because it passed within a sixth of the Earth-Sun separation. And uh, then it realized, oh, actually, the astronomers realized that it was moving too fast to be bound to the Sun. So it's actually an interstellar object, and it was the first reported. Uh, and I was intrigued because I wrote a paper a decade earlier forecasting no detections by pan stars of such objects based on what we know about rocks in the solar system. It turns out that to explain no more and more, you need an abundance far greater than you would expect from rocks uh, tossed into interstellar space from planetary systems like the solar system. So it's puzzling the fact that they detected it, but moreover, its properties were unusual. It, it uh, Based on the reflection of sunlight as it was tumbling, it appeared to be flat. Uh, the best fit model was a flat object. And moreover, it had no cometary evaporation that was apparent to telescopes. And nevertheless, it was pushed away from the sun uh, by some mysterious force. And I argue that it may be just the reflection of sunlight that is pushing it. And for that, it had to be very thin. And I suggested that it may be technological in origin. And then three years later, there was a technological object discovered that showed a push away from the sun by reflection of sunlight and no cometary evaporation. And the astronomers on the same telescope, the pan stars, realized that within a few weeks, they realized actually it came from Earth. This is a rocket booster that NASA launched in 1966. So it was discovered in September 2020. It was given the name 2020 SO. And uh, to me, it signified the fact that the idea that I mentioned for Oumuamua is viable because here is an object that shows these properties and we know it's artificial because we produced it. The question is who manufactured Oumuamua? And then in, uh, in January 2019, uh, I was asked for uh, a radio interview about a meteor uh, that was uh, discovered a month earlier uh, in uh, over the Bering Sea, and it was uh, 10 meters in size, very big one. And I looked online and found this catalog of NASA. Uh, and I asked my student, uh, Amir Siraj, undergraduate student, to go through the catalog because I was inspired by Oumuamua and search whether there is a, the fastest moving objects may be of interstellar origin. And sure enough, we found this one. And then the government confirmed the assertion that it is interstellar. So um, altogether, uh, this was um, the, actually because it was detected um, in um, uh, gen on January 8th, 2014, this was uh, almost four years before Oumuamua, it was half a meter in size, and therefore it was the first um, object um, uh, that is much smaller than Oumuamua. We, I, I estimated that there should be a million such objects within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun at any given time. And that's simply because the chance of the Earth to bump into one of them, to cross their trajectories, is quite small. And so uh, there are plenty of them. Uh, we were lucky enough to see one uh, in 2014, and the estimate is that they collide with Earth uh, once per decade. And the, the one from 2014 released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. Uh, we calculated that it was moving at 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system. So it was moving faster than 95 percent of all stars in the vicinity of the sun. And moreover, it had material strength that is tougher than all the other uh, space rocks, all the other meteorites in the NASA catalog uh, over the past decade. That, that was uh, 272 of them. So this was an outlier in speed. It was an outlier in material strength. And I decided to go ahead and arrange an expedition that will uh, look for the any anything left, any materials left from this object. We went there and we found it. We found spherules. These are molten droplets from the surface of this meteorite. Uh, and we are now uh, in the process of analyzing their composition. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this was part of the Galileo project, which you right. founded and yeah. back in uh, July of 2021. 
Yeah, now, two years ago, exactly. Yeah. And uh, that was based on, on uh, several multi-billionaires that visited the porch of my home along with other people. Uh, that was during the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, I, it was about half a year after my uh, book, Exoterrestrial, came out. Um, over the past two years, I had about 3,000 interviews with with huge interest from the public. Uh, also, you know, there are lots of artists that were inspired by my work. I, just over the past week, I received a message uh, from a, a sculptor in Spain who who is planning to create a sculpture in a celebration of my scientific research. There is a songwriter who won uh, three Grammys, four Emmys, uh, two Oscars and so forth. And he is writing a song about my research. And then there is a playwright who just sent me a few days ago a complete play that he wants to be featured in uh, on Broadway in New York City about the, the research. And there is a filming crew, one out of 50 that approached me to be part of the expedition. And I chose one that is documenting my current research. So there is a huge amount of interest. And, you know, during the expedition, I wrote 38 diary reports about my experience there. And there were millions of people who read them over the two weeks of the expedition. And I got a lot of emails, one from someone who said that he had a stroke just a few weeks earlier. And, and reading my essays gave him the strength to live because he enjoys the way science is done. A lot of people appreciate the fact that they got a glimpse into how science is done. So for me, it was the, the biggest reward that I could get that people appreciate this. And, and um, you know, it, it, that was my previous book, Exoterrestrial. There is a new book that I will have, in fact, in a month coming out titled Interstellar. And it's already available for pre-orders. Now, and so the subject there is sort of astrobiology in, in the larger sense, right? Because, yeah, Muamua confirmed a number of things, which is that, for one, interstellar objects are significant, are statistically significant, and that thousands of them have entered our solar system over time, and some stay. And those could be rendezvoused with someday and, and studied. And right. yes, and it, it, it is a bit like the Drake equation there. It's like if just a fraction of a percent of those were artificial satellites or something like the Voyager probe that just wound up here, well, the odds of us finding something are pretty good. Or yeah, pieces. well, actually, the numbers are even more promising because if you assume that Oumuamua was not functional, you know, it was not targeting the inner solar system, if you just say it was on a random trajectory and there are you know, and orbits are being po populated randomly with objects like it, then there should be a quadrillion such objects right now within the volume of the Oort cloud, the, the outskirts of the solar system. A quadrillion is 10 to the power 15. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge number. And that's why it was a challenge to account for such a large number, assuming that this object is a rock. Um, now, recently I wrote a paper and that was after my book was published um, about the possibility. I mean, originally I thought it could be space trash, like, for example, the surface layer of a bigger object, uh, mm -hmm. because you want it to be thin so that the, the reflection of sunlight pushes it. Uh, but uh, recently I wrote a paper saying, well, maybe it's a broken uh, Dyson sphere. It's a piece mm -hmm. from a... Uh, Dyson sphere is um, a, a concept that Freeman Dyson came up with for a civilization to harness the energy from the parent star. And mm -hmm. um, so by surrounding it with uh, uh, absorbing uh, uh, materials and, uh, of course, making a rigid body is impossible engineering wise and much a much better approach would be to have tiles that are hovering above the star and are basically balancing uh, uh, the, the gravity of the star by radiation pressure. So they are just floating like kites above the star and they overlap. And so you cover the entire star with those tiles. Uh, but then as the star evolves, eventually it becomes uh, much more luminous and then it would break up this uh, structure. So I said, mm -hmm. maybe the pieces from a broken Dyson sphere, you know, could appear like Oumuamua because it had uh, radiation pressure acting on it. Uh, and there could be many possible 
scenarios where a thin film or membrane uh, would you know, be abundant as trash, just like plastic bags are in the oceans. You know, the oceans are full of plastics and they keep accumulating over time. And the same is true for any technological trash uh, because it doesn't move faster than tens of kilometers per second. That's the characteristic speed of all the spacecraft that we launched. And that's much smaller than the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. So all of these uh, technological objects that are not functional anymore will still be bound by gravity to the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And they will be just floating around just like plastics in the ocean. And they keep accumulating over the billions of years that technological civilizations threw them. And so even if those civilizations are not around anymore, you could still find the trash, the space trash. We are sending five such probes already. Um, and so my point is, let's just check our backyard, mm -hmm. uh, meaning the solar system, and see if there is anything beyond the rocks that we are familiar with that might be a tennis ball thrown by a neighbor. Well, yeah, your your words here. That actually puts me in mind of uh, something that Gregory Matloff, he too is a professor there at New York City College of Technology. He's worked for NASA. And yes, he's a member of Breakthrough Starshot. And he said something very similar. I asked him about his paper that was on von Neumann probes and their multiplication. And so I had to ask, I said, what do you think of the Hart-Tipler conjecture? And he said, that's a ridiculous idea. We haven't even begun to explore our own solar system, let alone the universe. So how can we say there's no evidence? And he specifically pointed out the possibility of finding the remnants of interstellar probes in the Oort cloud, in the Kuiper belt, in the asteroid belt, Right? We're not going to find them floating exactly. around Earth, necessarily. And how we have, I, I can't recall the statistics, he said that within the asteroid belt, we've examined just a handful of objects up close, and there's right. literally hundreds of millions, and just two objects in the Kuiper belt. So, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> the, point, the point is really that the uh, interstellar objects was just discovered over the past decade, and I mentioned two of them. Uh, both both uh, the first two one uh, two that we detected appear to be different than the space rocks that we are familiar with so i think that is uh, uh, the way the universe sends us a message that you know we should be open minded as to what comes our way from interstellar space in in much the same way that um, you know most of the matter in the universe 83% of the matter in the universe cannot be found in the solar system it's called dark matter we don't know what it is and for 90 years, we've been searching for it. We haven't found it. So rather than say, like a paper a few weeks ago said, uh, when I came back from the expedition, it said, uh, well, we cannot fit the US government data about the first interstellar meteor as a stony meteorite of the type that we find in the solar system. Therefore, the data must be wrong. This is not a a, a, a viable approach because then you would exclude the existence of dark matter. You would say the data is wrong. I'm only fitting uh, the data with known matter in the solar system. Well, that's not the case. We know that. Um, and so we should be open-minded. I mean, it's a learning experience. Science is about new knowledge, not the all, you know, we, we are not supposed to always explain everything with past knowledge when there are anomalies. Where are, in particular here, there are objects that do not resemble what we already encountered. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to ask, just getting back to your recent expedition. So now, as I understand it there, you guys went out in a boat. You were just off the coast of Papua New Guinea in the uh, South Pacific, and you were using a metal net to drag the bottom of the ocean where this meteor would have landed to pick up basically the bits and pieces that were left over. Yeah. So and this was uh, what it was not a net. It was more of a sled, right. uh, based 200 kilograms in mass, uh, uh, one meter in width that was connected by a cable to the ship. Uh, the ship was fittingly called the Silver Star. And we basically, uh, we had a region of about 10 kilometers that we crisscrossed um, around the meteor path that was defined by the government data and by seismometer data from the region, uh, about 90 kilometers away from Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So in addition to 50 spare rolls, yeah, you oh, also... Oh, now we have more, actually. Oh, what's yeah. the total? What's the total up to? Uh, now it's more like uh, 150 because um, we looked at... Um, Last week, we looked at the, some uh, uh, additional material more carefully. The thing is, on the ship, we could all, only pick with our tweezers spherules. These are metallic marbles that we found uh, among all the particles that you know represent the sand uh, on the, at the bottom of the ocean, two kilometers deep. Um, so we found them. We could only pick up things bigger than a tenth of a millimeter with our tweezers. But now we find things that are smaller. Uh, in the laboratory. So last week, the tally increased to about 150. But uh, these are smaller spirals, mostly. Mm -hmm. And there was also uh, a wire, was there not? A, a yeah. stretch of metal wire and, yeah, just, just a lot of curiosities. So is there a earthly explanation, right? Something that, that could be ruled out right away. Is there an, ex an earthly explanation for these little marbles? Well, so um, we can already tell that these were a result of heating uh, the surface of the uh, meteorite to a very high temperature because they have ridges, they have dendrites on the surface that indicates uh, very high temperatures and fast cooling. And these are basically the droplets that melted off the surface of the meteorite. And we found them mostly along the meteor path uh, that we uh, localized. Um, and not so much far away from it. We made a map of those ferals and they're mostly concentrated along the meteor path. So that shows some co uh, correlation. And of course, we uh, went also to control regions, regions that are far away, tens of kilometers away, so that we can compare notes and, you know, compare the types, the type of spherules we find there from other uh, meteorites or some other background events. You can imagine um, other sources. Uh, I mean, the most abundant uh, uh, constituent that we found on the ocean floor that was attracted by our magnets is uh, volcanic ash, basically mm -hmm. black powder. And those particles are smaller than a tenth of a millimeter. We could filter them out with a mesh. But, um, you know, there could still be some uh, contaminants from geological effects or uh, other meteorites in the background. So what we are planning is to compare the composition of the spherules at the meteor location to those in the control regions. And we are in the process of, of doing that right now. It will probably take a few weeks. And we plan to report the results uh, in a scientific paper to be submitted to a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, the other thing is, you know, first we want to check whether the material itself is different than you find in the solar system in terms of the abundance of elements, uh, radioactive isotopes that have a finite lifetime. We could even date uh, the material, basically inferring its age. Uh, and if it's different from the age of the solar system, we know that it spent a long time through the journey in interstellar space. So that these are things we can in principle infer if we find them, um, you know, uh, if you make, make a census of all the uh, radio isotopes. Mm -hmm. So Let's assume for a second uh, that this was a, a piece of some kind of technology, uh, a satellite or a deep space probe. It melts up in the atmosphere. We are able to pick up these little granulated bits of melted metal, and the composition will indicate basically where it came from, or at least establish some constraints there. But yeah, it, there would be indicators that this was not a uh, naturally occurring minerals that were thrown out. Exactly. So that's yeah. exactly the second question that we want to address. Uh, if indeed the material is different from solar system materials, is it technological in origin? And you can imagine melting computer screens or melting semiconductors or melting an object like New Horizons, uh, a, a spacecraft. Obviously, the droplets will have a different composition than you find in nature uh, for naturally produced rocks. And hopefully we should be able to tell uh, that kind of an origin. And at the very, you know, we, we could also use the spherules as guide to where we might search for bigger pieces of the original object and go there again. And uh, obviously, if you find a big piece, you can easily tell the difference between a rock and a technological gadget because the gadget will have a label 
staying made on some exoplanet, or mm -hmm. uh, it might have also buttons that we can press, which will raise the question, should we press a button? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this this is the goal of the Galileo project, right? It's to exactly basically, yeah. Now that so, the... The, exactly the Galileo project, in addition to doing these expeditions, aims to find more objects like Oumuamua that do not collide with Earth. So the meteor was discovered because it produced a fireball, even though it was small, just half a meter in size. Uh, U.S. government sensors could see the fireball from uh, its friction with air. But um, an object like Oumuamua was detected just because of the ref its reflection of sunlight. It was detected by telescopes, and uh, therefore it had to be much bigger, uh, of order 100 meters, 200 times bigger, uh, in order for telescopes to see enough of the, ref uh, of the reflected sunlight. Um, and so um, in the future, there is the Rubin Observatory that may find yes. more objects like Oumuamua, and we hope to study them. And the third branch of the Galileo project is to study unidentified anomalous phenomena that the US government talks about. We have a working observatory that monitors the sky 24 seven at Harvard University in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio. And we're analyzing the data with machine learning algorithms that try to separate uh, natural objects like birds from human-made objects like uh, balloons or or drones or or airplanes and see if there is anything else. Mm -hmm. And satellite information too comes into this, uh, doesn't it? Exactly. We yeah. partnered with Planet Labs and we're getting their data. And so um, we will use that to look at the uh, objects from above, not just from below. We have uh, one working observatory at Harvard University and we plan to make five copies of it based on funding that we are expecting to receive and maybe even more depending if we get more funding the idea is to cover enough of uh, uh, in a, a large enough number of sites so that we can get to the bottom of the nature of those unidentified objects that the u.s government talks about well that all sounds very exciting and i think i speak for everyone when i say i look forward to hearing what the results are and it is very exciting to think that we are now on the precipice of this very new, very auspicious era where UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, has become a public matter, a matter of science rather than a clandestine affair that's overseen by the military and government agencies in total secrecy. I want to thank Professor Loeb for coming on and hope that we can pick this up again very soon. And a reminder to my listeners, Interstellar, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars, this book which addresses many of the questions we're now facing in terms of have we been visited by interstellar visitors and what does this portend for our species, for the future of our species. It is available now for pre-order. Its official release is scheduled for August 29th. And I now have uh, my copy, which I will be reading with great interest and reviewing very soon. Keep an eye open for that here as part of a new segment that looks at potential extraterrestrial phenomenon and how we have dealt with this over time. So thank you again, Professor Loeb, and good luck. And I also advise my listeners to check out the Galileo Project for regular updates on their research and findings. That too promises to be very exciting. In the meantime, thank you for listening. I'm Matt Williams, and this has been Stories from Space. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stories from Space podcast with Matthew Williams. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.